So how are we, family? Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord together, in the presence of God together? And I really believe that God has a word for us this morning. I want to honor pastors Alex and Dorcas in their absence. Um, we just love them so much, don't we? Aren't we super blessed to have um, senior pastors who have run their race and are running their race with um, endurance, with resilience, who have their eyes fixed on Jesus, who, um, who lead us really as a family together. And so we're so grateful for them. I always say this, but I never, ever, ever take the privilege and also the responsibility of preaching lightly. Um, I also say that it's a miracle that you see me doing this. If you knew where I'd come from, if you knew what God had saved me from and what he has done in me, you would know that seeing me speak in public is a complete miracle. But that would also not be possible if it wasn't for mothers and fathers who call out the destiny of God that is on your life and make space for that to happen. So I really want to honor them and thank them for the privilege. Didn't our readers do well? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So I'm going to dive straight in. Our theme this year is? Amen. 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 And um, I want to start by diving into that Exodus 16 scripture. Okay, so um, Tunde, you read that so beautifully. Thank you so much. So just to give some context, the Israelites were led by Moses and had recently escaped from slavery in Egypt. Do we remember this? Anyone watch the Disney movie? They've been delivered from Egypt. They've had a whole water parting, split the sea so they can walk right through it, experience. And then they end up um, crossing the Red Sea, escaping the Egyptian army. And now the Israelites are traveling through the wilderness on their way to Mount Sinai and ultimately to the promised land, the land which God had promised to them that he had delivered to them. So then we, when we find ourselves in Exodus 16, the Israelites have arrived at the wilderness of Sin, which is located between Elim and Sinai. Um, and the people have started to complain about, to Moses and Aaron about the lack of food. Now, anyone here ever given to a little bit of complaining? Does anyone here suffer with hanger? Okay. Manga. Yeah, manga's worse. Manga is practically biblical, man anger about, about food. Um, how long does it take for that hanger to kick in? If we're in Westfield, it takes Christian about three hours, two hours. He's like a newborn. You have to feed him every two to three hours, and then he stays happy. So imagine with, <laughs> with Martin's an hour, but you're such a happy chappy. Come on. <laughs> and they need a nap too. So the people of God are in a whole desert. And who knows that hunger and thirst is actually an uncomfortable experience. And we as New Covenant and as New Testament believers, how many of you have often said, wow, if I had seen the fire um, by night and the pillar by day, if I had gone through that Red Sea, I would never doubt God. But we're talking chapters before, they just had a whole army go into a river that was opened up by the hand of God. And now they're in the wilderness. And rather than concentrating and remembering the faithfulness of God who has done the most for them, they're grumbling about their hunger. They don't have a revelation, like Faith said, of a God who has drawn them with everlasting love and kindness and will do the most. He's delivered them once, so why wouldn't he deliver it again? Why would he fail now? He won't. What they actually do is they nostalgically recall the abundance of food in Egypt. So isn't that amazing? They were enslaved in Egypt under the rule of Pharaoh, beaten down, trodden, trodden on, persecuted. But when suddenly their senses, their earthly, their fleshly senses are lacking, they nostalgically would rather return to the flesh pots of Egypt than trust in the living God who delivered them out of it to give them something different that will actually sustain them. Doesn't that sound a little bit like Genesis? where Adam and Eve are in the garden and the God who's just done the most 
separated water from land, thrown planets into existence, breathed life into humankind, given them all that they need pertaining to life and godliness. And when the enemy comes and says, did God really say and presents them with something that is pleasing to the earthly, natural senses, that Eve actually gives up our whole inheritance to satisfy that one thing. And we, what we see is that same propensity in the people of God of Israel when they find themselves in the wilderness. So in response to their complaints, God speaks to Moses, and he promises to rain down manna from heaven. That's the word that we have. Um, the picture there is of bread, but actually, when you unpack the scripture, it was almost like when dew was on grass and it dried, the manna would appear. Um, I've got a little picture there that might give you an idea um, of what it might have looked like the next one along. So that might have been what manna looked like. God also pr promised to pr provide meat in the evening, so there were quails in the evening. And God uses this provision to test whether the Israelites will follow his instructions. They're commanded to gather only enough manna for each day, except on the sixth day when they can gather twice as much in preparation for the Sabbath. Are you with me so far? Um, at the end of the passage that Tunde read, which is not up there, but in um, verse 19, it says, Moses says to them, let none of it be left overnight or until the next morning. But they did not listen to Moses, and some left a supply of it until the morning, and it bred worms and became foul and rotten. And Moses was angry with them, so they gathered it every morning, each as much as he needed, because when the sun was hot, it melted. So we've got it so far. They're in the wilderness. They're complaining because they're hungry. But God is going to provide manna by day, quail in the evening. And they can only gather that which they need for one day unless it's in preparation for the Sabbath where they can have two. Otherwise, what will happen to it? It will rot and it will spoil. And when I look at this, I can't help but think that this wasn't just about sustenance, but that actually it was a profound lesson in spiritual dependency on God. It was a lesson about a rhythm of living where the natural is met by the supernatural. Their daily gathering of manna mirrored a daily dependence on the provision, on the presence, on the power of the Lord they couldn't hoard it for tomorrow. They had to trust for fresh provision every single day. And doesn't this teach us a vital lesson on daily dependence on God's grace? You know, we are not like the Israelites where we're depending on a pillar and a fire and manna. But we sometimes I feel like because we are living in this privilege of... Um, daily Pentecost of the Holy Spirit living within us that sometimes we can get so familiar that we forget we actually need fresh manna every day from the Lord Jesus. We actually need fresh manna from the Spirit of God to actually live naturally, supernaturally in the world and to, in the assignment that he has given us. You see the, and what you do is you see the heart of God over and over and over again, trying to give his people this gift of dependence on him. And over and over and over again, they reject it and they complain because they want instant gratification now in a way that they can understand. They treat dependence like a disease rather than a gift. When I say the word depend, how does it make you feel? What comes into your mind? I don't depend on anyone. Anyone? I don't rely on anyone. When we look at the world around us, is dependence celebrated? Absolutely not. Individualism is king. If it doesn't serve me, if it doesn't fit me, if it lets me down, I'm out and I'm on to the next thing. Because I don't rely on anyone. Independent women, independent men, independent nations, and an independent world. 
It's the same thing that comes from the garden where we rely on our own self rather than a reliance on the spirit and on the presence of God. Like in Jeremiah, not getting a revelation that he has loved us with an everlasting love and he has drawn us with loving kindness. So if you fast forward a little bit to Numbers 20, who read Numbers 20? I forget now. Joshua, there we go. And he read it so well. Um, So in Numbers 20, for context, the Israelites are now near the end of their 40-year period in the wilderness. Um, And they're wandering in the wilderness as a punishment because of their lack of faith and their disobedience earlier. And remember, they're journeying towards the promised land. And so they come to a place called Kadesh, where again, there was no water. And the people began thinking about the faithfulness of God and everything he had done for them and believing in faith that if God's done it again, he'll done it before, he'll do it again. No, they complain. They complain to Moses and to Aaron, expressing their frustration and again, longing to go back to Egypt Isn't it wild? So God instructs Moses to take the staff, gather the assembly, and speak to the rock to bring forth water. However, instead of speaking to the rock, what does Moses do? He strikes the rock, right? Because he's frustrated with the people's constant complaints. And water gushes out, so it's still helpful, But the consequences of Moses' disobedience are radical. Because Moses didn't follow God's specific instruction to speak to the rock, God reprimanded him and told him that he would not lead the Israelites into the promised land. It's interesting to me that Moses relied and went with a method that was familiar and suited suited him. Do you know what I mean? It was not actually hard for Moses to strike out in anger. If you go back to Exodus 2, Moses is out among his people and he sees the Egyptian rulers and what they're doing to his people and he strikes out and he kills a man. And in Exodus 17, there's a similar incident when the people are in a place where they need water. And that time, God commands Moses to strike the rock. And Moses obeys God. But it's interesting to me that Moses never, ever had a problem with striking out. It seems more natural to him, given the evidence of his behavior in these various different circumstances. But it was always a problem for Moses to speak. Always. So now we have this moment where you have Moses who has come... You know, Moses is that baby that's put in the basket and gone down the river. He's grown up in Pharaoh's house. He's come out of Pharaoh's house. He's been called to deliver the people of God. They've had a whole Red Sea. They've had manna. They've had quail. They've had fire. They've had the pillar. They've had all of these things. And even Moses, in the moment when God calls him and says, speak to the rock, cannot remember the faithfulness of God, that the miracle was not dependent on Moses, but the miracle was dependent on God, Moses obeying God and God therefore doing the miracle. It wasn't about Moses' ability to speak. It was about Moses' ability to do what God had already spoken. And what grieved God when Moses struck that rock instead of speaking to it was that it demonstrated a lack of faith and a reliance on his own understanding. He had an experience of, God did it that way before, so let's just do it that way again. Rather than applying the principle that God had been leading them through this entire time, that I will give you fresh manna every day, and don't bring that manna from tomorrow in today, because it will rot and it will spoil. And that's exactly what it did for Moses. So then if we come into the New Testament 
um, and we come into John 5, which is one of our anchor scriptures for this year in our, in, when we're focusing on naturally supernatural, we read Jesus saying to them, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, the Son is able to do nothing of his own accord, but he is able to only do what he sees the Father doing, for whatever the Father does is what the Son does in the same way in his turn. The Father dearly loves the Son and discloses to him, he shows him everything that he himself does. And he will disclose to him, he'll let him see greater things yet than these, so that you may marvel and be full of wonder and astonishment. So isn't this amazing? We have this theme here of a God who dearly loves, who dearly cares, who, who shows us the way to go, who shows us so that we're not full of discouragement and doubt and feeling like dependency is this disease, but we're actually full of, mar we're marveling and that we're full of wonder and astonishment and therefore we receive our human dependency on the living God as a gift. Amen. Is this making sense to anyone? Is it challenging anyone? Because it's challenging me. Jesus, in his dependence on the Father, he models, listen to this, a radical rejection of self-preservation. And he actually shows it to us as an idol. That's what it is in the wilderness again and again and again, the idol of self-preservation, the idol of if it doesn't come in the way I understand, if you don't speak to me in a way I feel comfortable, if my calling is not in line with what I have deemed sufficient for my life, then I will not rely on you. I will rely on myself and raise up the idol of self rather than leaning into this gift of dependence where I am covered by a loving God who will provide every single moment moment of every single day. Jesus declares that he can do nothing apart from the Father. He surrenders his own will, his own desires to the divine will, in contrast to the Israelites' hoarding mentality and Moses' self-reliant actions. Jesus, though he is God, embodies perfect trust and dependence on God for everything. He emphasizes that his works and authority come from the Father. And he invites you and I to emulate this dependence. So I want to ask you again, how do you feel about dependence? I believe God is asking us this morning, how do you actually feel about dependence? Are you actually willing to lean in and receive this gift of dependence so that you can live naturally, supernaturally? What's incredible is unlike the Israelites or even the disciples prior to Pentecost, we now have the privilege of coexisting with Christ and having the Holy Spirit dwell within us. Thank God, exactly. Thank God. <laughs> you know, we're not like Old covenant Christians where we had to wait for God to come down and speak to the prophet and then we would know what God was saying. We have a fully resurrected Jesus, a fully present, mature, powerful, dunamis Holy Spirit that is living and at work within us daily. Yet despite this unfettered access to God's presence, we often shy away from dependence failing to realize that it is in this very posture we tap into power. We tap into the power of the Spirit to move in extraordinary ways. And I believe one of the reasons that God is speaking to us on this today is that one of the biggest hindrances to living a naturally supernatural life is our human propensity to rely on memorialized memory and mandated methodology because we are either too impatient, too lazy, or too scared to give over and lean into true dependence on God. You know, we have had many, many words, London Network Church. I'm not preaching to those who are online. I'm not preaching to the wider church. God has been speaking to us, saying about obedience over and over and over again. Why do you think he's doing that? Because maybe we're not being obedient in some ways. Maybe we're not yielding fully into this gift of dependence. 
And it's out of that obedience that comes out of intimacy that we see a move of the Spirit. But so often we want to wait for God to move and then we will obey. But we see again and again and again and again that God wants us to obey and then he moves. Because he moves on the substance of our faith. In Exodus 16, we see that this um, test with the daily manna, it exposes the folly of self-preservation. It exposes it as an idol. And in fact, they were, can you believe they were so deceived that they preferred to go back to the enemy's ensnarement and have their senses satisfied than walk with God daily. And it seems like we could stand back and we could judge those people and say, that doesn't make sense. But if we look at our own lives, do we actually walk with the, with the revelation that we might judge them for not having? When your day is hard, when your marriage is hard, when stuff is difficult with your kids, when the money is low, when suffering and persecution comes, do we return to that which satisfies our senses in the moment? Or do we lean into the gift of dependence fully on God and see the supernatural flow out of us because like faith said this morning it is not about happiness happiness depends on circumstances but true joy that flows out from the living God that's full of living water means that you can be in prison like Paul and write with all joy and peace and that is naturally supernatural hello We have to get a revelation of this. We need a revelation of this. Because in this day and age where mental health is a problem and people are exhausted and tired, I don't believe people are just exhausted and tired or anxious or fearful because of demonic oppression, but actually because of the exhaustion that comes from self-preservation from refusing to fully give over and accept dependency as a gift from God and tear down the idol of self-preservation and actually take up a new mantle of walking with Jesus daily and trusting him for manna daily. When, um, when our youngest son was born, Jesse... Um, I, it, was, it had been quite a journey. Um, I was very, very blessed with our first two children, had very easy pregnancies, was pregnant, led worship till the day before I delivered, all that kind of thing, popped a baby out, walked out the hospital, and it was all good, you know? Not that, <laughs> not that that wasn't work, but it, I was very, very blessed. And then um, in 2020, the weekend that we went into lockdown, um, uh, about two weeks prior, I had found out I was pregnant with our third baby, a total surprise. And then the day that we went into lockdown, I miscarried that baby, um, which was probably one of the hardest moments of my life. Um, Because I had to wrestle, just like the people of Israel, with How can God allow something that feels like it's killing every sense in me and lean into dependency on God? And in my human mind, try and reconcile the goodness of God and the sovereignty of God with what I was actually experiencing in the moment. And in my humanity, that is not an easy thing to do. And I'm going to share very vulnerably with you, one of the things that I was so angry about was that baby who's now with Jesus, we weren't planning to have that baby. It was a surprise. And one of the things that really just gnawed at me was, why would you give this to me if you were going to take it away and set a desire within me for something I didn't even want in the first place and now I'm grieving it? It drove me up the wall and so that then had to kind of wrestle that through with God and really allow him to bring this is not in my notes so I'm assuming it's for someone in this room (laughs) because I didn't expect to share this with you um I had to wrestle that through and allow God to bring me to a place I had to allow God back in and bring me to a place of peace um and 
I used to pray this prayer, God, in everything I don't understand about you, I'm not going to let go of what I do know about you, and I know you're good, and I know you're kind. I used to pray that every single night. So then fast forward to a year later, we then fell pregnant with Jessie, who is the wild firework that you see running around most of the time. Um, and again, had a really wonderful pregnancy. And then after I gave birth to him, I was really unwell, completely unexpectedly. And I'd never had this experience before. Um, so I, I had him, and five days after I'd had him, the midwife came and did a, a check on me, and um, my blood pressure was through the roof. I didn't know that this was the case. I had no idea. I didn't feel unwell. My blood pressure had always been um, historically quite low and ended up spending a night in maternity intensive care because when they took me into the hospital, the midwife was like, you really need to go and get this checked. My blood pressure was up. My heart rate was up. My temperature was up. And they were like, something is not right. We need to take you in. So I've never, ever really been into hospital except to have babies. And that had always gone well. And suddenly I found myself laying on a bed, laid fully down, strapped to the bed with wires all over me. The curtain wasn't able to be closed and I wasn't allowed to hold Jesse. I could have him there with me because I was breastfeeding. But then when I fed him, the nurse would have to come and hold him on me and then put him down because they couldn't risk my heart rate going any higher. And in that moment... I remember thinking, this, this could be it. What's going on? What's wrong? I didn't expect this. I didn't expect to be here. And what happened to me in that moment, sometimes I think, gosh, I wish I was a stronger Christian and I didn't respond like this. But fear radically took hold of me. And anxiety radically took hold of me in a way that I have never experienced before. I'm not naturally a particularly anxious person person. I'm not particularly risk adverse in some ways. And the fear that gripped me to the point where I could feel my heart pounding in my chest, where any second I felt like I was going to panic and I was going to freak out. I'd never experienced anything like that. And what happened is the next six months of my life, I was in this place of anxiety and I'm not talking a little bit nervous. I'm talking I couldn't be left alone in my house because I was petrified. And so we had to, you know, we had to get amazing help around us. People prayed for us. My mum and dad really stepped in and spent lots of time with me. You know, people would see them coming to do the school run and being like, oh, that's so sweet. But it was actually because I couldn't physically do it by myself because I would start panicking. Um, Jesse is a gorgeous child, but he was not the easiest baby in those times. He would scream night and day. Night and day. Scream and scream like I was killing him. Scream and scream and scream and scream. Even when I was holding him, even when I was patting him, even when I was loving him, he would scream. And who knows for your central nervous system that is already shot to be around screaming literally eight hours a day, I was a mess. Nadine knows because she came and saw me next to my bed. I was an absolute wreck. And I remember feeling like I couldn't even really... I was so like this in my insides. I felt like I couldn't even really... I didn't really want to go to God. Or I didn't really feel like I could go to God. Not because I was doubting him. I was just too in the moment of what was happening. Um, and there was one day where um, I had to get my blood pressure checked. And I had to do that all the time. And it would make me super anxious. Because I was so scared of ending back in hospital again. And so I was going upstairs. And the midwife was coming to my house. And I was panicking and panicking. And then something, there was just this still, small voice because the midwife had turned up without warning. Usually they would warn me they were coming. And so if they warned me they were coming, I would call everyone to pray and say, please, please pray, please, please pray that my blood pressure is okay so that they don't take me back into hospital. And this time she turned up unexpectedly. And I had this moment where I went, but no one's praying. And in that moment, I heard the voice of God and say, you need to get a revelation that you and me is enough. And not just, not you and me, me, with you. 
is enough. It's enough. And I remember sitting in my chair, and I could hardly get words out, but out loud I said, devil, you cannot have my mind. You cannot have my mind, because God is here, and he is enough. And the midwife came, and she took my blood pressure, and it was fine. But I, what God began to speak to me, this is when God began to speak to me out of Exodus 16. And he said to me, if you will have eyes to see it, there will be manna laid out for you every single day. Every single day. Because I remember thinking I'd get to the end of one day and think, oh my God, how am I going to make it through the next day? I can't go through another day. I can't go through this again. And the Holy Spirit would speak to me and he'd say, but did you make it through today? And I'd say, yes, I did. And he'd say, and did everything that needed to happen today happen? And I'd be like, yes, it did. And I remember there was one day he said to me, and did you enjoy today? And I said, yes, I did. And he said, but you, so you can't take the manna from today into tomorrow, but tomorrow there will be fresh manna and I'll provide fresh manna for you every single day. And I began this incredible, vulnerable, painful, frustrating, incredible dance with Jesus to find the manner that he had for me every single day. And I felt like a wreck. I felt like I had nothing to give. And you know, there were people that said to me, you've never looked more beautiful, you know. You just look so peaceful and you're doing so well. And isn't Jesse such a great baby? And I remember thinking, what on earth are you talking about? But it was a naturally supernatural thing that God did. And the key was that I had to lean into the gift of dependency he was giving me rather than treat it like a disease or an ailment and something that I resisted and tried to continue to lift up and rely on my own sense of self-preservation. Jesse was not my first baby. He was my third baby. So I knew what to do, right? I had all the experience, right? I had all the ways that God had walked with me with those children. But that was not the manner for that moment. God had manner for me in that day. And if I just allowed and leaned into that... Breakthrough came. Joy came. I remember sometimes Jesse screaming, and I'd be bouncing like this up and down, like this up in my room, and I would sing, make me a channel of your peace, or whatever it was, or I'd sing, there's honey in the rock, water in the stone. It was supernatural. It was supernatural. Suddenly the terror that had been on me and in me lifted off and something different was birthed out of me. And I know to this day I'm a freer person because of it. I know that I know that I am. There are things now that if they had been thrown at me prior to that experience and manner and wilderness time with God, that would have knocked me. But now I'm more relaxed because I'm like, if God hasn't done it that way, then I know he'll do it some way. And when I wake up in the morning, God, give me eyes to see the manner so that I can give you glory. Because it's not about the outcome. He is responsible for the outcome. I am responsible for the obedience. Amen. And being obedient and following him and seeing him come through has birthed a confidence in him. You see, resistance to the gift of, uh, what's it called? I've totally, my dependence, sorry. <laughs> I'm just trying to come back to my notes after that whole thing. When we eat the fruit of the gift of dependence, it breeds confidence. Because resisting the gift of dependence reveals a confidence issue. It reveals an unbelief issue. So then when we look at 
2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. And it says, but understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents and all of the things. It says that they will have a form of godliness, the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. That is the fruit of when we rely on self-preservation, that we redo all the religious things and we rely on our methodologies from the past and how God did it before and everything he did before and how he's used us before but actually we're denying the power because it's not a walk of fresh manner every day where we allow God to do something different it's just that scripture is a sobering reminder because here Paul is writing to Timothy and he is not talking about the world he's talking about Christians He's not talking about the world. He's talking about Christians. He's talking about potentially you and I if we don't yield to this gift of dependence. That we will burn ourselves out. And I think the enemy would love us to burn ourselves out on self-preservation, having a form of godliness but denying its power rather than having us be in communion and relationship with the living Lord Jesus that fills us with living water so that we are actually never thirsty again. I find it incredible that it's Pentecost Sunday today and we're talking about this because we really need to live in a perpetual Pentecost with God where we are filled to overflowing again and again and again and again. Because church, self-sufficiency is a mirage that leads only to spiritual exhaustion and death. It's attempting to live a a supernatural life with mere natural strength. What does that mean? It means I do the things of God, but I don't know the God of the things. (laughs) it means that I do the things of God but I don't know the God of the things I'm not in communion with the God who has the power for the things it's when the things of God become the prize When the things and the stuff of the kingdom become the prize and the pursuit rather than the king of the kingdom, who is actually the promise and the pursuit. Daryl Johnson says this, the key to abundant life is not to try harder, but to die deeper. Not to strive more, but to surrender more. You see, on the other side of death is what? Resurrection life. On the other side of us accepting this gift of dependence that can make us feel so scared and so vulnerable is actually resurrection power and life, which is why the enemy tries to keep us from doing it. So what's the common thread, (laughs) Cara, that's weaving through these passages? It's the lesson of daily dependence on God whether it's the Israelites relying on daily manna or Moses learning to trust God at his word or Jesus demonstrating his reliance on the Father or the warning against superficial faith in Timothy, the message is clear. Our strength lies not on our own abilities or past experiences, but in our unwavering dependence on Almighty God, on matchless Jesus. What Anthony read was so powerful He said here, oh, isn't this beautiful? Oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord, who have no confidence in the proud or in those who worship idols. Oh, Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. You've done the most for us. Your plans are too numerous to list. You have no equal. And if I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to an end of them. That is the perspective. That's the revelation that I believe God wants to give us and birth in us this morning. That is why when we look at Paul and his life, when he's writing in Ephesians, he's writing from prison 
but he's writing from a place of joy. This is wild. If you just read this with me, I don't think it's going to be up there, but it's fine. In Ephesians 2, verse 2 to 7, we read, Paul writes, but God, he's writing from prison, okay, in prison. Just think of your worst prison. It was probably worse than that. This is like first century, I think, prison. But God, being rich in mercy, if you were in prison, would you be able to think that God was rich in mercy? But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. And by grace, you have been saved and raised up with him. And he has seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not by your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. What does that tell you? That tells you that Paul was in prison, but Paul was not in prison. Can I say that again? Paul was in prison, but he was not in prison. Because what does he write there in verse 6? He says, he raised us up together with him when we believed. And he seated us with him in the heavenly places. Because we are in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages to come, he might show the immeasurable and surpassing riches of his grace. Paul wasn't in prison. Paul was in Christ. Which is why he could write with joy and peace, like Faith was um, prophesying earlier, rather than being dictated to and cowering and bowing down at the altar of his circumstances. It was naturally supernatural. Paul had a revelation of living with daily manna from the hands of the Father, so that even in prison, he was not contained. He was in Christ. So living supernaturally means embracing the realities of life while simultaneously trusting on and relying on the supernatural power and provision of God. In Paul's case, he acknowledges the natural circumstances, but he refuses to be defined or defeated by them. I'm going to say that again. Paul acknowledges his natural circumstances, you can acknowledge your natural circumstances. Maybe there's been death and loss. Maybe your bank account is so in the red, you don't know what to do when you're up at night. Maybe the marriage is seriously under strain. Maybe a friend has betrayed you. Maybe you feel like you're being persecuted at work. Maybe your baby is crying day and night and day and night, and you feel like you're losing your mind. You can acknowledge the circumstances, but, be ref but refuse to be defined or defeated by them. Because you might feel like you are in a prison, but you are actually in Christ. And it's a supernatural revelation that we need, that we are actually living and walking in two places at once. Heaven is not up there. It's a dimensional thing that is here. And we are operating in both realms at the same time. I'm just going to read this, and I wrote this outside notes this morning. That this all becomes easier when we get a revelation of where we, are act, where we actually are. So just close your eyes for a second. So physically, you are in this room. But you are also seated with Christ, in Christ, in heavenly places. It's not an understanding thing. It's a revelation thing. I want to say that again. You are in this room and there are real circumstances, but you have and are seated with Christ in heavenly places. You are in Christ. You might feel like you're in a prison. You might feel like you're in a prison of physical limitation in various ways, but you are not in prison. You are in Christ. So when we get a revelation of where we are actually, where we actually are, we realize, we actually realize 
that living naturally, supernaturally, we are not waiting for some cloud experience to come and happen to us. We're not, we're not moving like that anymore. We're not old covenant Christians anymore. That's not what we're looking for. Actually, when we realize where we actually are, that actually we have a moment and opportunity to behold Jesus and to become like Jesus because we are in Jesus. And then we naturally take up our supernatural birthright to exercise his dominion on the earth. I'm going to say it again. When we get a revelation of where we are in relation to Christ, so we are in Christ and Christ is seated in heavenly places and we are seated with him, we are not waiting for some experience to happen to us and to come on us like the disciples did where they had to wait for Jesus to bestow power on them to do a specific thing. But actually, we naturally take up our supernatural birthright and exercise the rule of his dominion on the earth. Are we getting it? Are we getting it? It's a supernatural birthright for every blood born believer for this to be your daily experience Paul is not a special person he's a born again believer so what we read there is we have this experience we can have this experience where God really gives us a revelation that he has drawn us with loving kindness that he is not keeping anything from us he might be pre protecting us from things but that he has lavishly poured out his love on us and that from that place of being in him and rooted in him we can live in that daily communion where he gives us manna and out of that manna relationships flows the power of the supernatural God through us and I believe he has it for us and I believe there's some of you here who are burnt out and exhausted because of self-preservation and on this Pentecost morning I believe that God wants to fill us afresh with a fresh revelation and a fresh outpouring of his spirit and a fresh surrendering before him where we die deeper where we surrender deeper and um, receive that gift of dependency so that we can live naturally supernaturally and extend the kingdom on the earth like we're called to. Amen? Amen. So I really believe there's three things that I want to just highlight as we close, as I close. A resistance to dependency should be an alarm bell that there's a confidence and an unbelief issue with you and Jesus. And what, what he has demonstrated through the scriptures that have been read, the prophetic words that have been given, is that a confidence issue with God is illogical when we read that he has done the most from the beginning up until now. What we see, we can focus on what the Israelites did in Exodus, what the disciples did in John, what we've done in our own lives. But when we look at God, but when we look at God from the beginning, he has been pursuing us and pursuing us and pursuing us with radical rescue over and over and over again. Radical provision over and over again. Healing over and over again. Righteousness and grace that we don't deserve. And that's why I really believe God gave faith that word this morning, that he wants to us to get a revelation of his love and his care for us. Because out of that will come a confidence for that dependency. A continual confidence in continually depending on him. And I believe there's some of us here who you are burnt out because of that idol of self-preservation. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to rely on my strength. I, don't, I know you're asking me to do it that way, God, but this is more comfortable. And you're exhausted. And I believe that God wants to bring refreshing to you today as you surrender this morning, as you embrace dependency as a gift and not a disease. 
that he's going to restore life, that living water is going to flow so that you don't have to thirst and hunger and be parched in life. So that you might still suffer, you might still be in prison, but you are not in prison, you are in Christ and therefore you have joy and peace and kindness and patience and you have that access to the spirit and the presence of God because the Bible promises us where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty and fullness of joy which means you can be in prison and not be imprisoned. And lastly, that there are those of you that I feel have been in a manner, a manner season where God is asking you, walk with me every day. I believe it's for all of us, but in, you might be in a specific time where you feel like, I can't see the next day. And God is saying, it's okay. There's manna for today. And there will be manna for tomorrow. And there'll be manna for the next day. And why can you trust it? Because I will be with you. Amen. Amen.